Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. Sorry, we're a little tardy. We were um, just were in an executive session to discuss matters made confidential by state or federal law, FERPA. Um, no action was taken. And here we are. Um, so first I'll just share that the next meeting is on March 3rd, which is next Tuesday at 7 p.m. right here in 211. Um, I'll also share that we have a Board of Education seat up for election um, in May. And anybody who's interested in running for um, election and being on the Board of Education can speak to myself or any of my colleagues about the joys of school board service. Um, and if anybody would like a petition, um, they can see Miss Julia Famularo, and she will give them to you via her email, jfamularo at haldaneschool.org. J.U. Famularo. J.U. Famularo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Benante. So we have a few updates this evening, Ms. Daly, and I'd like to welcome the members of the community and our uh, staff who are with us this evening. Um, I'm going to start with an update for the board on the 2019 uh, referendum. I do have some slides uh, that I'm going to reference here, and I'm going to ask that uh, uh, Tim Walsh also join me at the microphone because Tim's going to uh, take a portion of this. So as you're aware, just make sure we're working here. Yep. Um, as you're aware, we passed a bond referendum uh, last May, and as part of our review of our processes related to uh, the work that now goes into uh, that work being completed on our campus, we want to keep the board routinely apprised of our prog of our progress. Excuse me. So I'm going to go over a few things this evening uh, to set the foundation for that, and then I would anticipate that. Uh, once a month, Tim and I will provide you with an update where we are, uh, because as you know, these referendum uh, projects from the time they're approved to the time the work actually gets completed can span actually a couple of years. So we want to keep the board apprised of where we are um, in relation to the process uh, so the board can anticipate any potential action items that may come their way. So uh, if I'm uh, being a good student of history, the initial conceptualization of this uh, referendum started back in the 2016-2017 school year. As I look through our buildings and grounds meeting minutes and old board uh, meeting video, uh, that's when we started to really start uh, started to talk about work that may be done on our campus. Um, the conceptualization of the project was anticipated to be put before voters in May of 2018. Uh, however, for a variety of reasons, that was delayed. Um, uh, those initial uh, discussions were quite broad in scope. Uh, they included uh, basic upgrades to our facility, um, which I would say are uh, you know, pretty standard stuff, um, uh, and, and some really, um, uh, I would say, uh, some really big picture items. Uh, um, I found reference to a potential addition to the high school um, as being uh, obviously much bigger, uh, much more costly. Um, so uh, again, the span of the conversation has been uh, quite broad. Now, ultimately, uh, as I arrived and working with the B&G committee last school year, um, as well as um, with Ms. Dinio, uh, we really narrowed the focus of, the, of anything that we were going to put before the community. I believe there was a recognition that there were more uh, immediate needs uh, that if we could, we needed to address in the near future while we had a, a longer term conversation at some point uh, down the road about any additions to schools and things of that nature. Uh, so we narrowed the scope of that referendum uh, last school year to really focus on three areas, uh, health and safety infrastructure repairs, uh, academic program uh, improvements, uh, which really alluded to a potential renovation of space in the Mabel Merritt Building and the district office, and then preservation of the physical plant. Um, and there's a picture of doors here for a reason, because we have doors that needed to be replaced, windows that needed to re be replaced um, uh, more in the short term. Uh, and one other factor that I want to um, remind the board of is that we were deliberate in narrowing the cost of this project to $2.3 million or anticipated cost because we realized that with uh, debt that we had dropping off, that's what we could afford to bring on in new debt uh, without having an impact on taxes. Um, uh, so we framed this as a tax neutral proposition. Um, and again, it was uh, approved by voters uh, last May. Now, uh, 
since that time, so from May uh, through uh, uh, now February, um, if I were to go back to last summer, we um, submitted um, an initial list of projects to the state education department who essentially serves as like the building department, if you will, um, when it comes to school building projects um, for review. Uh, we realized through discussion with our architect that certain projects associated with this referendum were um, were uh, could be framed as for expedited review, uh, which means we could go through the state approval process, which can be lengthy, um, a bit more expeditiously, and uh, potentially set ourselves up to get work done on our campus this summer. Um, so that's what we did, and we framed that as phase one uh, uh, projects. And uh, with that, Tim is going to now uh, talk about how we categorized phase one. Uh, while the slides look a little different, this is also in front of you on a spreadsheet that I uh, just uh, handed out. And for members of the public, these are uh, both the uh, presentation and this document are um, in board docs. So any public uh, or community member can can review them as well. Uh, so Tim's going to talk through how we packaged uh, the two projects um, uh, and talk through where we're at with that. Hi, good evening. Um, here we have the capital referendum phase one. Phase one was work that we anticipated completing over the summer, um, and it was broken up into several different phases of construction. The first was general construction, which is here in front of you, where we had the window replacement of the elementary school building, the curtain wall assemblies, which are the doors and the glass assemblies in the elementary school, window shades uh, in the elementary school as well, and the window screens. So over to the right, we have what the estimate was of the referendum, the Fuller and D'Angelo estimate, and then what the bid price was. We received one bid for this project, and it came in at $734,000, which was uh, about $154,000 above the estimated cost from Fuller and D'Angelo. Um, that was the general construction phase. If we can go to the, to the next slide. The second bid was a site construction. This included, um, replacement of some guardrails, some fencing with guardrails, replacement of some fencing, playground equipment, which is just a swing set replacement in kind, as well as the repaving of the Bell parking lot and the parking lot alongside Craigside Drive. Again, we have the referendum estimate, Fuller and D'Angelo's estimate, and the bid price. We again received one bid for this project. This was $10,000 under Fuller and D'Angelo's uh, bid price. The next work that we had was district bid or district um, supplied or purchased equipment. So in here we had a cafeteria equipment which would be purchased off state contract, cafeteria floor replacement, which would be um, off a of state contract as well that we would just enter into an agreement with, as well as some cafeteria furniture uh, replacement costs. Fuller and D'Angelo did estimate the um, uh, cafeteria floor that was part of the state uh, education submitted project, but it was just extracted from the bid and so that we could self bid it out. Um, that's still to be determined. The cafeteria equipment, we do have a bid price on through a uh, New York state contract, um, which we have a purchase order in place to purchase that equipment. Um, so in this regard, um, I think it's the next one, but um, oh, sorry. sorry about that. Um, as the site construction is $10,000 underneath the estimate, we would recommend um, to go ahead and award that for phase one. However, for the general construction, given that it was above the uh, estimated price, we would recommend rejecting the bids and re-advertising that project. So good news on the site construction. Not so good news, I guess, on the general construction because uh, it's coming in uh, significantly over what uh, we had uh, anticipated. Um, having only received one bid for each project, uh, just to speak about this a little bit, is, is tough because you don't really have a sense of uh, what's out there. Um, I think uh, this is where economic forces really are at play. Uh, um, when the economy is not as good, um, although this week I, I shouldn't say that, um, uh, but there's a lot of housing going up uh, generally uh, uh, for the building trades right now. It's a, it's a good time. Um, we tend to not get as many bids as we would um, or may have 10 years ago uh, when everybody was looking for work. Um, so this is something that Tim has uh, recommended uh, for review, uh, again, back to the Buildings and Grounds Committee. Um, so again, with that, we're uh, recommending not to move forward 
with the window replacements, uh, the stairwell, curtain wall, exterior doors, the shades, and the window screens, and to rebid that out um, at the appropriate time. Uh, but to get ready to move forward with the site construction. Um, obviously, we want to leave time uh, for the board to ask any questions of Tim or me or Ann related to this. This is not on the agenda for this evening, but with the board's approval, uh, Tim has notified uh, the Buildings and Grounds Committee of what our recommendation is going to be. Thus far uh, today, we uh, have no concerns uh, from the B&G Committee about that. We'd like to put this now on for the board's vote or action next week. Um, if possible, to line this up to be done um, uh, come uh, July and August. One thing that wasn't uh, included on the site construction under paving is that this also includes the uh, playground area um, or the um, blacktop area right outside, adjacent to the playground in our elementary school. So that's included there under paving as well. Ask a question. Um, in the general construction, on our uh, spreadsheet, it, it says Fuller and D'Angelo estimate, and then it says it includes the 10% contingency. That's not up on this slide. But can I assume that the bid price does not include a contingency plan? The contingency, the bid price includes all costs for uh, the contractor. So when we did our estimate for the referendum in Fuller and D'Angelo, it included contingency and construction costs. So we're baking in, so the 734,000 bid doesn't include the fact that it, sometimes construction ends up being more just because things happen, things come up, things we're not anticipating, and it ends up being a little bit more expensive along the way. There's a $10,000 cost that is not, in, that is within that, uh, seven hundred and thirty-four thousand dollars. Oh, I see the contingency. Okay, although ten thousand dollars doesn't sound like a much. very large contingency. Doesn't sound like a very generous contingency budget. It's what Fuller and D'Angelo typically includes. I know that, um, as per their recommendation, they don't like keeping a larger contingency in there because they feel that it is not a bid price. So anything. I see. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So if we rebid out. General construction, what, how does that change the timeline? So, uh, Tim, feel free to jump in or in if I'm mistaken. But now we have another, you'll notice that the, the total cost of these projects was uh, one, about $1 million. And uh, we have others uh, that are currently listed on your spreadsheet as phase two. So uh, through, we want to discuss this with the Buildings and Grounds Committee, but our initial uh, thoughts are that we would then rebid this out, uh, the general construction, as we package uh, phase two elements um, and consider that as a, our next action moving forward, uh, and then resubmitting for approval. And then depending on what that approval process is, seeing if we could line it up for the following summer. Um, uh, so that would be summer of 2021 as opposed to uh, obviously this summer. Um, now there's some risk in that. Uh, costs could go up, um, but also costs could go down, or we could get additional bids, it could be more competitive. Um, but that's something that, you know, when you're, when you're doing building work, that's, that's what comes with it. So um, there were some, as we went line item by line item, and uh, something, uh, it's not currently in front of the board, but uh, was the summary uh, recommendation from Fuller and D'Angelo, uh, just because on this, that will be included on the, uh, if you agree, on the site construction work next, uh, for action next week, so you could read their full recommendation. Uh, one thing that came up with the general construction is we recognized uh, for the window project specifically Specifically, there were certain um, costs uh, as Fuller and D'Angelo reviewed that bid uh, that they felt were relatively high. Um, that, but and again, in the absence of other bids, uh, uh, you're not really in a position to do anything with. Um, uh, so hopefully, again, if it's a more competitive environment, when we put this out to bid again, uh, we would see a better price on some of those figures. And Tim, I don't know if there's anything else I should uh, add about that, but please. And I'm sorry, I, I was thinking about something else while you were speaking, the putting out for another bid does mean that the that the phase one general construction would be postponed yes. to summer 2020. Yes. Yes. No, so summer 2021. At summer the 2021. earliest. 
at the earliest. Because we need right. the time. Um, right. Obviously, it's window replacement, so right. we can't have kids in classrooms while we're doing that. Um, so that would be the next window, <laughs> no pun intended, um, uh, of time that we would actually be able to complete a project like right. that. Um, but that's, uh, that's at the earliest. Right. Um, so I guess my question becomes about the windows, and I don't, I don't want to pretend that I've followed all of this perfectly or that I remember <laughs> all of it. But the issue about the windows always was that there, there were real concerns about the seals and the amount of yes. moisture that, was, that, that they were allowing into the building, um, issues related to the opening. And is, it, is there a potential that by waiting another year, I mean, we've had a, we had a try summer. It hasn't been particularly wet. Is sure. there? That's a, a lot of money, right? I mean, that's a big difference in terms of the amount of money that we expected the bid to be, and it right. is. But like, is there a potential that 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 that, that there could that the that problems could exacerbate, and it could be more expensive to re remediate or fix that? Can you speak to that. Um, at this point, given the conditions that we've seen or that I've seen since I've been here uh, within the elementary school, I don't think there'd be any. Uh, reason or hesitation to delay it any further and if anything we would just as a staff have to monitor it more closely and make sure that we mitigate any issues that we see thanks i mean because that i mean because that's very comforting in terms of 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 of, of thinking about postponing mm -hmm. this and we would be resubmitting the package as it stands for general con construction there's no room to resub we're not talking about going back to the permitting process or you know, looking at any new architectural details that may come up in the interim, are we? Or is that minor architectural minor. details, perhaps, because there was some feedback from the B and G right. committee, um, but nothing that would interfere with the approval process. Any other questions? So, as I said, we anticipate there being a monthly update now. Uh, so I know we're. I'm putting a lot in front of you uh, this evening, uh, but it's uh, it's that time now where we're getting, and it's a good thing, uh, where we're getting uh, to the point where we're actually uh, packaging these receiving bids and obviously um, preparing to put uh, potential action items before the board. So you can anticipate at next week's meeting there will be an action item related to the site construction uh, for your approval. Um, and then we will keep you apprised of both the B&G committee's work uh, and also um, any work that's going on in between, any deliberations that are going on in between, uh, and our monthly updates to the board. Yes, yeah, so we spoke about having it under like unfinished business just yes. as an ongoing mm -hmm. yeah. item um, on a, at the workshop meetings yep. um, unless something else came up that needed it sooner. In some months, the update may be that there is no update, yeah. um, but... We'll see how that progresses. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I think with that, uh, Jen, Do I'm you turning have any it over. Comments? I don't have any comments. I think I'll be making them periodically throughout the meeting. Okay. So <laughs> I'd like to turn it over to uh, Julia yes. and Chris yes, uh, for please. their detail report. And as a reminder to the board, uh, periodically, and to the members of the community, periodically throughout the school year, our building principals and uh, department um, leaders. Here you go. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll provide a more uh, comprehensive update in addition to the monthly updates that you hear that are more informal in nature. Uh, and tonight, uh, Ms. Sniffen's going to present an update on Haldane High School, and Mr. Sam's going to provide uh, an update on our athletic program. So, Julie, I'll turn it over to you to start. I'd just um, like to point out this picture. I took it. There's no filter on it. I was walking up the hill from a game or something one nice day. Job. and I said, how nice the reflection off the windows and uh, as the sun was setting. So, uh, no filter on that. Um, so thank you. Um, tonight's presentation feels a slightly disjointed to me, if I'm, if I'm being honest. There's not like a true flow. It's kind of highlighting three different areas within the high school um, based on some feedback from the board over the years uh, and based on where we're at right now uh, within the building. So to begin, I'm going to talk a little bit about the building goals this year that we set out uh, to accomplish. I'm going to talk a little bit about College Board and ACT data. Um, last year, we spoke a little bit about graduation rates and graduation uh, and I know Judy spent a lot of time talking uh, this year about New York State testing and New York State Regents uh, exams, and we really haven't 
dabbled at all or taken a look at College Board and ACT. So I thought I would give those numbers to you uh, this evening. And then last year, we kind of touched on the senior internship and that program, and you had some questions on that. So I thought I would dive a little bit into the senior internship program and provide you some information on that process. Uh, and then Chris will pick up the last piece on athletics. So to start this year, uh, two building goals. One really focused on expanding deeper learning experiences for students uh, within the classroom. And the second was to take a look at mental health and social emotional needs of the students within the high school. Um, so within that, uh, some of the action steps that we've taken already uh, within the high school you can see here. So on the left hand side, I focused a little bit on the deeper learning and on the right hand side, the social emotional um, goal. And within the deeper learning, we started the year uh, with some data analysis on New York State Regents exams, but I also must say we took a look at some of the standards and alignment of the standards to look at areas that teachers may want to be focusing on and really diving in as they develop units of study through the year or make some changes. Uh, in addition to that, we took some time at faculty meetings uh, to look at theory and practices and best practices within faculty meeting, whether it was reading, readings, whether it was teachers sharing out. Um, Judy and I um, created a 15-hour course on engagement, student engagement and deeper learning. Um, if you would like, obviously this will be on board docs, but all of these are hyperlinks as well, so you can see the development of the 15-hour course that we created um, right here through this presentation. Um, not every staff member participated in the course. Um, we had 14 staff members that started. It was demanding. It wasn't just an easy course. Uh, I think we ended with 10 actually seeing the 15 hours through and developing the unit of study and incorporating uh, deeper experiences. Uh, today was actually our last class, uh, and the teachers shared out on some of the work they had done. And I just really quickly highlighted some of the key terms of things that they were embedding into their unit. Um, flipped classrooms, Socratic seminars, uh, guest speakers, debates, station-based learning, mini projects, gallery walks, like just some of the things that they were uh, including in their unit. So it was, it was nice to see that today. Um, my classroom observations focused on evidence and looking for those deeper learning experiences within the classrooms and then providing feedback to the teachers. And then this spring, our staff read will be teaching uh, for deeper learning tools to engage students in meaningful uh, and meaningful, I'm sorry, and meaning making. That's a tongue twister. Uh, so that's where we are with that. In regards to social emotional health, um, this year we created a committee of staff members within the high school, and I just have to thank Scott Manny, Amanda Cochin, Michelle Valenti, Marilyn Granisi, and Lisa Khan for joining me in that work and kind of planning out an action plan for the school year and how we were going to approach this. Um, so one of the things we did, we had Matt Ballison, I think some of you were there and saw him at the evening presentation. Um, we looked at expanding our dialectical therapy program uh, within the high school and increased groups. We conducted a connectedness survey from the staff perspective in regards to their connection with students. Um, I'm going to dive into that and give you a little bit more detail about the connectedness survey, the results and what we did with them. Um, one of the action items from that connectedness survey uh, was to bring in some theory and practice based upon the results of the survey into our faculty meetings. So I'll share that. The, it is a hyperlink to show you some of the readings we did within those meetings. Um, mental health first aid, uh, we have some high school staff members who are going to the hub, uh, thanks to that connection with the hub on March 21st, to the training on mental health first aid. Um, and then the step that we'll be taking in April is the students uh, survey on mental health. And that's through the pride survey, which going back quite a few years ago in the middle school, we did that work over time, kind of evaluating our students within the middle school. Um, I found the data to be very helpful. Um, you know, it'll be our first year of doing the survey, so we won't have baseline data, but my hope would be that that would continue year after year to have some baseline data and see if some of the things we're implementing um, are helping our students. So as I said, I was going to dive a little bit deeper into the connectedness survey. Um, and this was developed by the teachers. This, wasn't, this isn't an outside survey. We did this years ago um, as well. And the same thing, we, we found it to give us some valuable information on our students. Um, so the teachers were given a list of students that they had in class, and they were to evaluate whether they have very little to no connection with a student, some connection, or a solid connection. And those were the definitions that were given to the connection um, that the teachers could identify. 
again, the full um, survey information and kind of what we did is in a presentation that was hyperlinked into the action items, so you can go back and take a look at that. So just for the sake of conversation, I just compared kind of freshmen with seniors. Um, the least connected student is at the top, and the pie chart on the bottom is the average connectedness with a student within that grade. So with our clinicians, we then looked at the students that we didn't feel had, the adults didn't feel they had a connection with uh, within the building. And the clinicians then looked at that and determined ways that they could try to work with that student engage with that student, figure out interests of that student, and maybe interest groups or clubs or sports or after school activities that we could work to get them involved in to be engaged with uh, some more pro-social activities within their day. We were able to kind of identify some of the students that we felt had less connection with adults. They were students who were new to Haldane. They were students who may have more of a quiet personality or introverted personality. Um, or at times challenging home lives. Uh, and again, the data wasn't shared with the entire staff. That data was just shared with the clinicians um, and the clinicians working through that. Again, the action steps, uh, the clinicians were doing check-ins uh, and then the faculty media greetings, which I mentioned already. Transitioning, told you it's like a little bit of a stop and then pick up somewhere else. The flow is a little off. Um, so the first would just be the AP. Again, this is a cohort, a uh, small cohort here at Haldane, uh, as we know. So when we look at this data, we have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, one year you see 228 exams were given, and then just a couple years later, 298 exams were given. Well, it's a bigger cohort. There's more students. There's going to be more exams given uh, in the year where you see that. Does this work? Oh, kind of here versus here. Um, and again. Can I just yeah, sure. Add, has the general number of students grown consistently between 2015 and 2019, or just the number no, of taking the AP test? I can't say that it's grown consistently. Okay. Um, I would say it, the population of the juniors and senior classes are up and down. Yeah. The 2019 class was a larger class yeah. um, than any of the prior years. Right. Um, APs are offered sophomore year. There's typically only one exam in sophomore year that's offered. Junior year and senior year have many more. Would you, um, would you say generally that people are taking more AP tests generally over time? Um, it's hard to say. Okay. It, it's, it's hard to say. I think that um, some AP classes have um, different prerequisite courses. Yeah. I think we've started to expand and opening the option of AP and not always having prerequisites, but really trying to have more of an open enrollment in some of the AP classes. Some AP Calc, you really have prerequisites that you have to take to do, take AP Calc, but AP Psychology, um, there are not prerequisites for that. So we're really trying to work on that as well, opening up these courses for all students. So there may be slight uptick because of that too, but it's hard to say overall. I'd have to really look at it. Um, this is just comparison, again, with Haldane to then New York State and the Globe. And then college admissions exams. Um, there's two, right, SAT um, and or ACT. Um, we do have a parent night on that if people want to know the difference between the two. Um, but you can see here um, Haldane students are performing well on college admissions exams. And this is last year's seniors you're looking at. Senior internship. We have a senior in the audience too, so she could maybe <laughs> some of this. But um, Ms. Seidman starts with an introductory lesson. Uh, there's a video there that's created. Uh, again, it's a hyperlink. You can take a look at it. There's then parent permission. From there, students are given potential ideas of things that they can do for their internship, and maybe they have some of their own ideas that they want to explore. From that, the student is responsible for making the connection. Potentially, a resume is involved, depending on where they want to do their internship. Potentially, an interview would be set up, again, depending on where they want to do their internship. Um, internships start on May, right around May 17th, I think is the Monday this year that they start, and they conclude through the remainder of the school year. 
Um, there will be site visits and log submissions that seniors need to do to verify that they've met the weekly requirement. There is an employer evaluation that is given then to Ms. Seidman, who oversees the program, in addition to the seniors then having to do a final presentation to their classmates, um, sharing out what they've done at their uh, internship. Some of them do videos, some of them do slideshows. Uh, we try to come in and see what they've been doing. It's been, it's nice. Julie, is there yeah. a, um, is there like a, a, a sheet, an approved sheet of like where students can search for internships and? So there's a permission slip and then this list that's up here. I just was going to that oh, next oh, slide. Oh, you, you were going that's there. Okay. This we are constantly adjusting and changing and adding mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. Um, people say, oh, I would love to. The um, Chamber of Commerce would say, hey, you know, they help us with some of this. Um, so depending on, there's different categories the students can look at. Um, and then they can reach out to the different areas if they have an interest in what's here. Um, I'll just note that the Haldane video production, which was done last year, again, all of that, thanks to the Haldane School Foundation, all of that equipment. But the video they created last year, I'm not sure anybody here has seen yet, but that's the live link to that video um, about the Haldane High School experience as a whole. Um, it's about seven minutes long. And this isn't necessarily approved. This is just where students have done it. Is that right? This but is where they've reach, done it. But students can go re reach out to anybody. Is that right? Yes. Okay. But then there's a contract with right. that place for them to be approved to that have an intern. Um, you know, sometimes people will say, well, I'm working at, uh, you know, Old Souls in town. Can I just do that as my internship? Mm -hmm. If it's their regular employment, we're, we allow them to work where they're doing the regular employment, but they have to take on duties and jobs beyond what the scope of their employment is. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's more of a manage, managerial role or they're doing the scheduling, um, you know, or they're doing the ordering that they normally wouldn't do. So it can't just be their standard Here's my job, and now it's my internship. Oh, and, and at this point, we have 100% student interest. Um, we're finalizing some of the um, internship setups for this school year, but 100% of students expressing interest in participating. And last year, there was also 100% participation. So good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, I'm just going to do a brief overview of our athletic program. And there's four areas that I really want to highlight. Um, I'm going to discuss what we currently offer, uh, our athletic and academic achievement, our team accomplishments, and then um, some, am I forgetting? Well, we'll get to it. <laughs> so, uh, But I know the first thing we're going to discuss is our offerings. Um, and just before I discuss what we have on the board, um, I did not include our mergers with Garrison because those are programs that they offer. We're allowed to send students if we come to an agreement between both boards of education, if it works based on numbers and facilities. So this is just currently what Hal Dane offers uh, on our own. Um, so as you can see, we have a girls and boys varsity soccer program. We have three levels of volleyball, varsity, junior varsity, and modified, a varsity girls tennis program, a boys and girls cross country program at the varsity and modified level, and then for football, we have a varsity and modified program. And this is just for the fall season. So as you can see, there's plenty to do, to do as a student athlete uh, in the fall. Uh, as we transition into the winter, there are less sports, sports offered, but we do have more levels. So for both our girls and boys basketball programs, we have a varsity, junior varsity, and a modified level. Uh, for indoor track, for the girls and boys, we have a varsity program. And then I include uh, our hockey program. We currently only have one student athlete participating in hockey, um, but we are a merge program with the Lakeland School District, uh, which is Lakeland High School, Walter Panis High School, along with Hendrick Hudson and Putnam Valley. So it's a five school merger. We only have one participant at the moment who happens to be the starting goalie and is one of the best players on the team. Uh, and then we'll transition to spring shortly, um, but we have a varsity softball program, a varsity and modified baseball program. We have three <laughs> levels of boys lacrosse. Uh, we have a junior varsity girls lacrosse program this spring. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then for boys and girls track and field, a varsity program, and for boys go golf, a varsity program. Uh, for girls across last year, we had the program for the first time, and we offered it at the modified level. 
uh, the numbers were in, the, I think, 18 or 19 girls. Um, but as those girls are transitioning to higher grades, um, it looks like this year we're going to have to transition from a modified to a JV program. Um, if the numbers are there, we will have both a modified and JV. But based on preseason coaches meetings and interest meetings, it doesn't look like we're going to have the participation numbers to support two teams. So we're going to have a junior varsity girls program this spring uh, with the hope of adding a varsity program in the future, hopefully within the next two to three years. So those are our offerings uh, for this school year. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the percentage of our high school students who participate in athletics. Uh, I'm going to start by just reading off uh, a little trend. Uh, so across the nation, uh, the NFHS is the governing body of high school athletics. Um, and according to them, in 2018, uh, participation numbers in high school athletics decreased for the first time in 30 years. Um, so what I did was I took last year's numbers and this year's numbers. And if you look at our numbers from last fall to this fall, we've actually um, beat that trend. We actually have had an increase in participation. So last fall, we had 36% of our high school athletes participate, uh, high school students participate in athletics. This fall, we had 43. Uh, this win uh, last winter, we only had 16% of our athletes or students participate. This year, we had 20%. So our numbers are actually against the norm, which is a great thing. Uh, we have kids coming out for teams. We have people participating. They're active. They're involved. Um, it goes back to Mrs. Stiffen's slide on connectedness. Our students are involved in a lot of different activities. They get to know each other, know the adults in our district. Um, it's a great thing that we have so many programs to offer and so many students involved. Chris, that actually brings up a question. Did the staff that Julia uh, surveyed, was that teachers? Or did it include coaches? It, didn't oh, it would only include coaches that are also teachers. That were also teachers, school, I correct. see. I see. Not coaches that are outside. Okay, okay. Um, another thing I've spoken about in the past is at Haldane, because we offer so many programs, but our student body population isn't that large, it's important for us to have athletes who play multiple sports. Um, so what I did here uh, was I just I did a summary of kind of last year's numbers. Uh, and out of the 285 high school students we had last year, 158 participated in at least one sport, which means 55% of our high school students play at least one high school sport, which is a phenomenal number. Um, as you go down, we had 49 students participate in at least two, in two sports, and then we had 25 students participate in three. So we have a lot of students doing a lot of different things. We don't have as many students specializing as maybe other schools in the region or across the nation, uh, and it allows us to be a, su a successful uh, athletic program in a variety of sports in a variety of seasons. I talked about this last year, uh, but it's something that I think is important to bring up again. Um, we have a, a, a lot of our teams um, classify as scholar athletes um, because of their academic success. Um, so in order to receive scholar athlete team recognition, uh, the team's GPA has to be at least 90 for 75% of their roster. So that's not an easy achievement, but our kids make it look easy. We have a lot of highly uh, intelligent students who work hard in the classroom, <laughs> on the fields. Um, and you know we're one of the few schools, if you go to a lot of gyms, you'll see the athletic achievements. But we also have a scholar-athlete banner because we feel like this is an important thing to highlight, to recognize, for the kids to strive for. Um, so this is something that a lot of our teams are continuing to qualify for. Um, as of this year already, these are the programs that have received scholar athlete uh, recognition. Obviously, again, the spring season hasn't come, um, but I, I anticipate based on you know success of our other programs and uh, our students that we'll have a few more teams to add to this list come the spring. So congratulations to all these teams. Uh, so just staying on the uh, scholar athlete trend, um, in, in the fall, uh, we had 69% of our high school athletes uh, earn a GPA of 90 or higher during their season, which is incredible. Um, to have almost 70% of your student athletes with a 90 GPA when they're getting home late from practices, home late from games, working during the um, weekends, it, it's, it's a real you know, attribute to the, the talent and the work ethic of our student athletes. So um, just thought that was important to highlight. And then in the winter, it's obviously a smaller number just because there's less students, uh, but we still had 51% of our athletes with a GPA of 90 or above. 
Uh, and the winter, you know, it's also a little more difficult because both boys and girls basketball and track, the hours are a little different as well. Um, so you're getting home a lot later for track. Shannon knows sometimes you're there all day on a Saturday or a Sunday, 9, 10, 12 hours in New York City. So if you're, if you're in those programs, you really have to put your best foot forward in terms of your academics, uh, and our students are doing that. So again, congratulations to all those students. Uh, and then just a couple team accomplishments uh, so far this year. Uh, we had an incredible fall. Uh, seems to be the trend the last three or four years. But we had our girls and boys cross country teams as sectional champions. Uh, we had our volleyball team as a league, sectional, and regional champion. And then our girls soccer team was a sectional and regional champion as well. Uh, and then this winter, our boys basketball team were league champions. And then there's a small little... Uh, slide on the bottom. Uh, sectionals are next week for our boys and girls basketball program, so hopefully we could add a few more teams to this slide in the next week or so. And that was it. I know I've tried to, yeah. any questions? Sure, I have questions for both of you, but I'll start with you, because you're standing sure. there. <laughs> um, d uh, I, saw, I think it was 55% of high school students participate in some sport. Um, do you feel like there are students who would want to participate in the sport, but either we don't offer the sport that they'd want to participate in, or it's a scheduling thing? Or I would say yes. I know every, every year I get a few calls about sports that we may not offer, yeah. and we sometimes try to go to, to another school to merge with that program if yeah. another school is willing to do it. Um, but I also know there's scheduling conflicts, because our kids are involved in drama, other extracurriculars. You know, As much as they do with athletics, they do with other things as well. So I think scheduling is a piece to it, too. Um, but our kids, they're incredible. They, they're involved in so many different things. They, they, they're successful at so many different things. Um, but I do think you know, there are maybe a few kids that don't participate because of scheduling conflicts. Do you feel like, I'll, I'll ask one more. Um, do you, uh, in, more generally, in terms of what athletics re represents to Haldane and the, both the student population and the community population, um, uh, yes, a lot of, I, I always talk about their great athletic programs and people can participate. Um, do you, would you change anything? What, is, it, is it where you want it? Is it where you think it should be? Should something change? Should So I think in terms of changing things, it's really a, a getting a feel for what the community wants, what our kids want. You know, starting that girls across program, that was years in the making. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, hey, let's start a team. Mm -hmm. That's because we have girls that have been playing lacrosse for five, six, seven years at the elementary and middle school level. So just kind of getting a feel for what the community wants through conversations with you know, community members, the rec department, that kind of thing. Um, I think there's always room for improvement, no matter what we do. Um, but I do think that we have a lot of you know, uh, good programs, strong programs. The one thing I'd love to see more of is just um, you know, we do have a hard time at times finding coaches, um, and that's just because of scheduling and the hours and that kind of thing. But we, the coaches that we have are high quality. You know, Coach Flaherty for volleyball and Coach Swicart for girls soccer, they were recognized as Journal News Coaches of the Year. So we have a great staff. Um, sometimes it's difficult for certain sports to find people. Um, but uh, besides that, you know, I'm always looking at ways to improve it, and I'm open to suggestions. I, I have no suggestions on <laughs> athletics, <laughs> just in general. Uh, but I'll ask you one more thing. What about like physical education for students who are not on teams? How do you mm -hmm. think about that for the community? Sure. So I think at the high school, uh, we have a tremendous physical education program. Um, I think at the middle school and the elementary school, it's also very strong. And the reason I highlighted with the high school to start with is if you've been to other neighboring high schools, if you've seen phys ed classes, Participation numbers are not always there. The units that are offered, the variety, whether it be lifelong fitness or certain sports. We have a, an inclusive program, many different things, whether it be wellness, sports-specific activities, fitness. Um, I think we have a strong physical education program. Again, there's always ways that we can improve. Um, but overall, I think K-12, the phys ed department, is doing a really good job. Uh, last year, our goal was fitness. This year, our goal is, continue, is, is to continue with that, but we're also talking more about nutrition, hydration, and wellness. Um, so I, I think we're, we're making strides. Um, but again, there's always room to improve. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Can we give a shameless pitch to what time they are at the Westchester County Center on Monday and Tuesday? <laughs> that's, that's in my board report about 15 minutes okay. from now. Okay. So stay tuned. All right. Thank you. Did you have questions for Julie? I do. Okay. Is 
that okay? Yep. Sorry. Um, so I would just I would ask uh, two things. One would be um, uh, I, I'm always impressed with the high school reports and the diversity of uh, classes and AP tests and all those sorts of things. If you um, so there are two questions. One, if I sat last year and I sat this year through the same presentation, how would how would you try to measure how the school itself is moving forward and improving year over year? Um, well, last year's presentation and this year's presentation were very different sure, focuses. But, yeah. um, I think this year, in terms of our work and things we've been talking about right now, there's definitely, obviously, a focus on mental health. And I think that has improved for the staff and for the students, the focus on it, the attention that we've been giving it, um, the understanding of our student need, the understanding of the student today. Um, you know, I was saying today at AC, the student today is so different than the student 10 years ago. Um, and, and really spending time at our CST meetings that we have with our staff, really focusing on the need of the student, not just academically. Um, I think there's definitely been a push for that this year. Um, I think another thing this year that we've spent a lot of time talking about, especially at department chair meetings, is the elective offerings for students that may not want an AP course or a college-bearing credit course. Okay. Um, and you'll see a little bit more from me on that within the next couple meetings um, in regards to elective offering and um, rotating in electives over time. So I think that's something different this year um, that we're spending a lot of time talking about. Great. And I, I, yeah, go ahead, go. Well, I mean, I actually noticed something that I, I I'm gonna that I picked up on in terms of your presentation, which is the focus, the decision to focus on the deeper learning. Right, one of the things I really, I mean, I, I really respect that that has been an emphasis, you know, in the district for a while. My anecdotal understanding was that it maybe hadn't taken at the same level at the high school for really good reasons. You have departmentalists, you have experts in their field. It, it For lots of good reasons, something like that might, might take a little bit longer, but then the commitment that you and the district showed to really continuing to pursue that, especially given what's really very clear evidence about the sometimes more difficult to measure, but the really very solid evidence for the benefit that that has for students' intellectual development. Um, I noticed that, so I wanted to point that out as something I noticed over time. Um, and I don't know if I would call it a, an improvement per se, but I would definitely describe it as a, an important forward movement. And there's always work to be done in that area. I think the work around our strategic plan, the work we'll continue to do uh, in that area will just further the foundation and the work that's being done now. All right, one more. What do you want from the board? Um, you really want to know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Julie has what? a very long list. Uh, I see this um, list. <laughs> one of the things that is difficult um, right now is um, we have teachers teaching in three or four different classrooms. Um, so when we want to focus on deeper learning experiences, when we want to have Socratic seminar, when we want to have station-based teaching and learning, um, and you're in three or four different rooms because of space and size and where we're at, um, and, and I know we're all looking at enrollment numbers and things like that right now, that is a struggle for us, is teachers in multiple, multiple classrooms. I think there's only one or two teachers that are in their room all day other than that. I don't it's think tough. that's something that the public really knows. I mean, no. my son went all the way through Haldane High School, and I don't think I realize the extent to which teachers are doubled up, like share their classrooms, and the extent to which teachers don't have a given classroom until I got on the board. And I think, um, I think, I mean, you brought it up. I think it's an yes, important. I, I it was a magic wand question. Right, I right. Felt like. but, but so, no, no, know. and I'm not saying I'm not saying I know what the solution is. But I do <laughs> think the level of the challenge that space presents at the high school is not well known, um, even among high school parents, and those then certainly not um, 
in the community at large. And kudos to the teachers too, because they are incredibly flexible. Oh, it's super. And, you know, but there are definitely times of like, you know, I'd really like to do this. I have two classes, they're in two different spaces. And then we're like trying to shift other people around to allow for that setup of that lesson to happen. You know, science, no, science teachers do not share. Well, they share their rooms. There's other people that are in their rooms, but they aren't expected to set up labs in a math classroom. They teach all of their right. science classes in the lab. Right. Um, but other people teach in science labs. So you may have a math class in a science lab or an English class in a science lab. But it's so hard for a professional to have real ownership of their craft if they don't have their own space to make their own right in order to like create an environment for the environment that they want to create for their students and teaching is learning teaching and learning has changed not as much as we would all like it to change but it it, it has changed <laughs> um and you know yes yeah. at times what we see as good instruction is hard to do when you're in four different rooms yeah thank you thank Perfect. you Okay, thanks guys. That was a great report. Um, okay, we're moving into, I'm sorry, that's, is everyone comfortable? Did anyone have any more questions? Okay. We're moving into communication from the public. I'll read our little statement here. The Haldane Board of Education desires and values input from the entire school community. For those who wish to address the board, please sign in and state your name for the record. Please keep your remarks to three minutes or less. Disparaging remarks and discussion of district personnel are prohibited. Although we do not engage in dialogue, we are listening. Please leave your contact information with our district clerk, Ms. Julia Famularo, for prompt follow-up from the board president or superintendent. Would anybody like to speak from the public? Okay. Going into uh, committee minutes. Health and safety are here. Our district-wide safety team uh, minutes I think are in executive content because they are confidential mostly. Correct. Uh, yes. They're specific to the procedures and routines regarding safety on campus. So we did include those in executive file attachments so the board could be aware of them, but it uh, likely wouldn't be appropriate for us to display them for the whole community. And the buildings and ground minutes are here. <laughs> and I'll just share, um, I read those buildings and grounds minutes and uh, I was you're not still reading them. I was exhausted. <laughs> I was exhausted after reading them. Um, that Miss Megan Shields, she writes some very comprehensive minutes, and it sounds like it was a very comprehensive meeting. So, uh, if I may, I, just all joking aside, the committee has been wonderful about really exploring its purpose and how it should fun function in honoring the technical expertise of many of the uh, members uh, who are a part of it, as well as the community's values for how we make decisions regarding the expenditure of public funds. So um, we had a very, uh, we're having very a very healthy dialogue, Sean, I don't wanna speak for you, um, uh, about how that should work in terms of a process, while at the same time, um, having some level of efficiency to it, obviously, so we can make decisions uh, uh, and be good stewards of, of public money and how we direct those funds as an administration and as a governance uh, and for the board uh, from a governance perspective. So um, a lot of the minutes uh, obviously um, uh, pertain to that. So uh, Yeah, and that's something we've talked about as a board that we'd like to see the committees uh, really relook at their charges and how to function most effectively and the buildings and grounds committee is certainly an example right. of that so, so you will great. note that later in the um, agenda I believe I'm sorry if I am mm -hmm. jumping ahead but the revised charge for the BNG committee which we've discussed uh, periodically um, is now on the agenda because it's gone through uh, a full review uh, by the committee <clears throat> okay moving into our information reports um, our student advisor I'm assuming Andrew's at play Andrew's practice at play. I think he's been at Saw play that. practice all, all, all year just pick a play. It's like pick a play. He's there. Yeah. Or a musical. Or whatever. Um, so we'll um, hear from Miss Jammin, our elementary school principal. Good evening. I wanted to highlight um, some of the student advocacy work that has been going on at the elementary school that was in my report. Um, our fourth graders have been doing, or just concluded, doing some research on 
natural disasters, and they took that work and put together a presentation for the District Safety Committee on what they felt the District Safety Committee should be considering when preparing for disasters. So they had advice on what we should have in safety kits and procedures we should consider, um, and it was very passionate and uh, informed presentation um, from our fourth graders. Our fifth graders were um, just had their artwork, which was a collaboration between their social studies unit on human rights and their artwork um, with uh, Ms. Branco in art, where they researched human rights and learned about different um, events in history and uh, different people who are, are working in those areas around the world and found a story that spoke to them and created artwork that was then displayed downtown at the hub um, for a three-night art gallery, um, which was very powerful. It was, it was difficult to hear some of them speak about some of the uh, stories that spoke to them. Um, personally, it was hard to hear a 10-year-old tell me about the 10-year-old forced marriages that they were inspired to speak out against um, around the world. So really powerful work created by our fifth graders. And our student council um, took on what they feel was a um, difficulty among recess and that um, kickball and flag football are um, not inclusive or supportive of the variety of student needs that we have and advocating that I should use some of our building budget to purchase wiffle ball equipment because a T would allow our kindergartners to participate. There wouldn't be the level of um, difficulty that uh, tagging presents in, in football and they had really passionate arguments about why wiffle ball should be included in their research, recess programming. So they wanted um, $35 designated to wiffle ball equipment, which the faculty heard their presentation at our morning faculty meeting. They came in early to present their argument and budget um, and the faculty overwhelmingly agreed that we should uh, support their their um, initiative. Um, so just different different levels of um, them advocating for things that they are passionate and learning about in their classrooms. Um, and then, as crazy as it is, we've started the process of welcoming in our new kindergartners for next year with our uh, parent orientation meeting that just happened. Um, so already looking forward to, to next year's work. Just, just a quick yeah. question. Um, Currently, w where we stand on, you know what I'm going to ask. Yeah, <laughs> for kindergarten. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we have 49, I believe, okay. is the um, current registration. Uh -huh. I don't know, ha not having lived through yeah. the registration process here at Haldane, um, are some of those registrations holding places, but the students won't actually attend? Are they going to private schools? Are they, okay. um, I'm, not, I'm not sure... Yeah, how that we have, a, yeah. I personally don't have a good handle on it, and it seems like the numbers are off from our enrollment study and what they would have anticipated with that. So, forty-nine is our number, is but I now. will keep you up to date. Right, no, no. Thank you. It was forty-one when we had the orientation, so oh. that's, that's a good ridiculous. trend. But right. I don't, I don't know. All right, thank you. All right, any other questions? Great. Okay, Dr. Sealke. Good evening, everyone. You know, I love hearing the report from Ms. Sniffen and from Mr. Solemn about all the things that um, our high school students are doing and our student athletes are doing. And um, to piggyback on that, not only is Haldane a strong school in the region, but we have a strong region of schools. And one of the things that the middle school has been involved in this year and last year is interdistrict collaborations. So. I've been sharing with you periodically updates about our eighth grade interdistrict inter collaboration with North Salem, Croton, and Pleasantville. And just recently this month, there was a different collaboration that was born at uh, PNW Bosey's through the literacy program there. Over the summer, districts came together to talk about what they would like to see if there was sort of like a literacy roadshow, so to speak. And it became known as the Literacy Learning Walks. And the first trip was to Carmel. And our teachers went to Carmel to visit 
Carmel's literacy program. And part of the deal is if you get to visit schools, then you also have to host schools. <laughs> so um, our seventh grade ELA teacher, Danielle PC, um, was such a champ at inviting a room full of people into her classroom for her AIS ELA um, work. And it was such a, a, it was such a pleasure to watch teachers learning from the practices of other teachers in the region. Um, and those are connections that'll continue because there's gonna be other stops on the literacy learning walk and um, our teachers will go off to them as well. So um, you know, thank you for the opportunity of the strong relationship we have with our BOCES so that we can, even though we're a small school, um, we don't have to operate in a silo. We have wonderful things going on and we can expand our cohort by participating in the wonderful things that are going on in other schools in our region. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sniffin. <laughs> uh, just quickly to talk a little bit about civic-minded students um, here at, at Haldane. Um, I think you've seen some of the results of our Model UN and our students going up to Albany, but this week we have students going to Bard College on the debate um, circuit to start. Um, and in addition to that, um, we are fortunate to announce that Damian Vladimirov um, was selected as only one of two students um, to go up to Albany to represent Putnam County at the Inside Albany Conference uh, for students. So thank you to the Putnam County League of Women Voters um, who are sponsoring Damien based upon his essay and his work uh, around uh, students involved in civics uh, and civic-minded civic students. Um, so I'm excited to state that. Um, along the lines of visiting and sharing and going out to other schools. This Thursday, we have Highlands High School is coming to Haldane High School um, to take a look at our freshman seminar, um, the transition programming that we've started for our freshmen into high school, in addition to conversations around our mentoring program uh, with the eighth grade students. So I'm excited about that. And I must mention the play, uh, March 13th, 14th, and 15th, Fiddler on the Roof. Um, tickets are on sale online, uh, and I hope to see everybody there. Thank you. Mr. Salem. Oh, I'm sorry. I, sorry. Go ahead. Go, okay. Went so out of I, order. Oh, I just wanted to uh, mention next week's sectional times and dates, um, as promised. <laughs> um, I'm going to time to see if it was 15 minutes or not. But um, So our boys' basketball team plays Monday night at the Westchester County Center at 6 o'clock against Tuckahoe High School. Our girls' uh, varsity basketball program plays Tuesday at 3 o'clock at the Westchester County Center. Um, if both teams uh, advance, the boys would play next Saturday um, at 12, and the girls would play at 2 next Saturday. So hopefully we have a back-to-back -back, uh, pack Saturday for championship games at the Westchester County Center. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Terrence. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to circle back to the board last time I was here giving my presentation. I discussed that our related service providers were beginning to um, develop tools and strategies for preschool parents to share um, prior to students coming to kindergarten. Um, I wanted to let you know that um, at the kindergarten parent orientation, we were able to distribute those uh, materials to parents and they're also up on the website now. So if you go to the website on the PP, under the PPS department or under the kindergarten registration tab, uh, you can find those tools and strategies that were developed by um, our related service providers in the areas of social emotional learning, um, language development, and motor skills development. Um, and this is just the beginning of trying to connect with those parents months before our students come to kindergarten. Uh, so we were able to share that on January 30th. Um, in terms of staff development at this time, most of our staff development uh, within both our 
staff meetings and our uh, after school staff development has focused on workshops for goal development for IEPs. Um, I share that because right now we are starting our annual reviews, which is the time of year that we're developing IEPs for next year, and all of our uh, providers are being asked to develop goals uh, with students in mind that are appropriate and measurable. Um, so we're doing a lot of training in there, that area at this time. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So do you all have like a vision for how parents would use those tools or how we'd communicate those tools? I mean, I think it's I think it's great that that they're there, and I, I apologize if I'm not remembering from your presentation. Like, sure. what was the motivation, and what are we ho hoping that those can accomplish? So the motivation came out of um, students are coming to kindergarten. We're finding uh, even students that haven't been identified as having needs per se in terms of, um, you know, some students come to us with a need for speech language therapy, for example. Some students, and they've already, um, they have IEPs, they're all ready getting those services. Um, what we're finding is when students come to kindergarten, there are all different levels in all different areas, um, whether it be their language development, their motor skill development, um, or their social emotional development and their behavior. So um, sometimes we give them what we call building level services, where um, our related service providers are either pushing into the classroom or um, pulling out students for these services to help develop those skills. Um, so this was somewhat preventative in nature and also you know our parents are coming into kindergarten they're nervous are is my child ready for kindergarten is this um, you know the time for them to come um, so this was provided to give parents really practical ways to develop those skills um, to say you know a lot of our students a lot of our really little kids are using um, electronics a lot of the time so this these are more physical things that they could be doing at home these are um, speech and language activities that they could be doing in the car when they're driving. These are games that they can play to increase social emotional functioning um, that are really pretty easy um, things to incorporate into their every day. Um, and if you look at those, you'll see the tip sheets on there. I said last time, some of them I wish I had when my children were little because um, they're really practical but creative things that I think can um, give them a boost right before they're coming to kindergarten because they have eight months and eight months right now you know, when we may in January, it's a huge amount of time in a little person's life, right? Right. Oh, great. That's a, and so that's the idea is as parents are bringing their students, to, uh, beginning to register their students, making sure that the parents are aware of those resources. Oh, that's nice. Right. So we shared the paper copies at the, kin at the orientation for parents, mm -hmm. and then we referred them to the website as well. And then in the spring, I'm going to be meeting with parents whose children have IEPs, so preschool, Committee on Preschool Special Education, those students who have been identified, and I'll provide paper copies there um, to those parents as well. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mr. Walsh. Hi, good evening again. Uh, the facility staff has been very uh, busy this past month, this past month uh, making sure everything has been cleaned and thoroughly disinfected. We all know what time of year we're in, uh, so we spent the winter recess, both the evening shift and day shift uh, together, making sure everything that could be touched or grabbed or held has been uh, cleaned and disinfected. Um, that being said, we had a little taste of spring here over the past two days, so we're looking forward to working with Chris and the uh, coaching staff to make it our fields ready. We're not quite, quite ready to put the plows away, um, but we're hoping that they're not gonna be utilized anymore. Um, so we're looking forward to that over the next uh, couple weeks and seasons. Thank you. Okay, uh, consent agenda minutes. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. These are minutes from our February 4th meeting. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent agenda, financial. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent agenda, personnel. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. This <laughs> 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 is the first one on there. Okay. I'm being sad. Oh, oh, oh. Um, it's sultry to me. Yeah, no. it, it was a little <laughs> sultry. <laughs> it, was sultry. <laughs> it was a little <laughs> sultry. <laughs> 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 Um, yes, yeah, so number one, we have the resignation of our district clerk, Ms. Uh, Julia Famularo, and um, although that is sad news for us, um, we are happy for Ms. Famularo's next um, adventures, and um, it has been an absolute pleasure 
working with you thank and you, we really Likewise. thank you for your service you really kept us all together um over the past how many years five as clerk yes uh, five years <laughs> as clerk yes yes and a real um Haldane uh, friend a real Haldane patron and parent and you've been on the board table with us for five years but yes. doing many other things uh previously so thank you for your service Thanks. you'll be missed um, any other comments or discussion about our agenda? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unfinished business. Uh, here is the, um, we made some, we had some discussion about this last time. This is the new and improved charge for the Buildings and Grounds Committee. Um, is there any thoughts? Any, any things? Are we ready to approve? Yeah? Ms. Fimler? Recommendation, okay. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the amendments to the charge for the Haldane Buildings and Grounds Committee as presented. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 New business approval of the CSE CPSC placement recommendations. Ms. Femular? Mm -hmm. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the recommendations of the Committees on Special Education and Preschool Special Education as presented. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, now we have our, our first draft of the Haldane Central School District calendar for 2021. And uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bernante if you have anything you'd like to share. Sure. So I'll, I think I'd like to start with just giving a brief description on what the process is like for calendar development, and then board members may have questions uh, about what went into this year's process. Uh, we usually start when BOCES uh, generates a, a draft calendar for the upcoming school year, uh, and then we bring BOCES draft calendar back. Um, BOCES will engage the superintendents in discussion just about I'll say calendar dynamics that come up uh, each year where certain holidays are falling um, and, and then what um, districts plan on doing to account for the number of student contact days uh, that are included, usually that are dictated by your, your teacher's contract. Um, uh, and then some, uh, to some extent, New York State uh, regulation as well. Uh, so that's where it starts, and that process usually starts in January. Uh, and then we have a calendar committee, which has uh, representation from our, our teachers association and also from our CSEA. Uh, and we review the um, BOCES draft calendar along and create a draft calendar for Haldane. Um, that calendar is then circulated throughout the faculty and staff uh, for feedback, and, and we, bring, we come back as a calendar committee and, and make final uh, revisions and recommendations uh, before I present it to you um, as a Board of Education. So uh, some unique things about uh, just the draft calendar for, for next school year is uh, there was a desire on the part of our uh, staff to start prior to Labor Day. Um, so there are two superintendent's conference days, um, uh, September 1st and 2nd, uh, respectively. And there was also uh, a desire to start with students uh, prior to, to Labor Day. Uh, now, as I look back, um, the we have done this before. Uh, this is not the first time that we've uh, done such a thing. Uh, I think uh, I look back as late as 2010-11. Um, it seems like uh, at the latest we did it, though, was also 2015-16 or 16-17, uh, where we started staff and students that week prior to Labor Day. Um, uh, now, there are uh, in doing so, that provides us with a little more flexibility throughout the remainder of the calendar. Uh, so you will note that um, we have also included the day before Thanksgiving as a day off. Um, I believe we've done that in the past. Um, December break is pretty much uh, what it's always been. Uh, we did include um, uh, three days um, as an extension of President's Day. We only had two days this year, next year three. Um, looking back, we had done that in the past, um, uh, depending on the year. Um, uh, what's new this year is also, or I believe is new, is also uh, including a three-day, um, three recess days around uh, the Memorial Day recess. So Memorial Day and then the Thursday and fire, Friday prior to that, uh, that typically has been a two-day um, uh, I, should, I shouldn't frame it that way, um, a day prior to the weekend and Memorial Day um, in the past. And I believe the reason for that is that um, the BOCES calendar this year uh, and the other uh, schools in the region did not uh, 
uh, take off for Rosh Hashanah in September. Um, whereas in years past, we had done that. So there was an extra day um, really out there uh, that we had um, that we did not need to be in session or students did not be, need to be in session. Um, and we placed that um, in May. Is that because Rosh Hashanah doesn't... It begins at sundown mm-hmm. on the 18th, I believe. Oh, I see. So it goes into a, a weekend. Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, so looking across the region, uh, there are a few schools whose calendars are set up similarly. Um, most schools are starting with staff prior to Labor Day. Um, uh, uh, and then I'd say about half of the schools in the region are starting with students prior to Labor Day. We are. Um, or we're recommending to. Um, in the county, Carmel also is. Putnam Valley is not. So um, throw a district out there. I can probably tell you what they're doing. Um, the, uh, so uh, this is what the, the committee had recommended to bring forward to the board. Um, we typically will leave it here um, and it's presented. Uh, it's out there now. Um, uh, but I would look to move to have the board act on it uh, next meeting, which is only a one-week gap. Uh, for planning purposes. Do we know what Garrison is doing? I did isn't not. Isn't that always an issue in terms of... Of course, of, that's the district I don't have in. Sorry, in I didn't look to Garrison that, first. They may not even have it out yet. I Correct. Think that's usually and I think that may for, have... Uh, I'm afraid that the, may have gotten um, lost in their transition of mm-hmm. leadership because I don't recall uh, Dr. Jackson being at our initial BOCES meeting when we discussed the calendar. Um, and I have not checked with her um, as we're creating our draft, but I'm happy to. Because that's the transportation issue yep. always. Yeah. And we try our best to parallel off yeah. of one another, but I would want to confirm that with her. So thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate the explanation for the how the pro- calendar comes together. Sure. Um, and that staff want to start before Labor Day. I'm mm-hmm. curious what the rationale for starting. Like I, I appreciate that they, I appreciate that they have a rationale. I would like sure. to know what that rationale is. I, as I presented it to staff and on the BOCES calendar. Um, most were starting at the very least with staff prior right. to. Right. Um, the, the student days, I guess, that I had. Correct. To and then um, as we set it up, uh, we examined starting with students before. And I do believe we have started with students right. before in the past. Our staff did not have reservate, did not, the committee did not express any reservations about doing so. They had actually brought that forward. Mm-hmm. I did not have any reservations about um, doing so either. Um, considering that it had been done in the past, and it generally provo- gets us started. Um, yeah. I think there's a, um, I understand, uh, I guess my question would be, what would be the reservation at that point about starting with right. kids? Right. Um, if for me, none. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because <laughs> for me, none. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest though. When I looked at it, I, I looked at it from the from the eyes of a parent, mm-hmm. right? And what it would what right. it would be like for me as a parent to to have the calendar that we have, and mm-hmm. and I actually think there probably is a really great rationale for starting before Labor Day, right? That it gives kids a couple of days right. to come in, to 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 figure things out, to really start the the process. If you do it after Labor Day, that most you're probably going to only have a three day week anyway. Um, and so you're still going to need those first few days to get ready, but it really does mean that kids come in and have a couple of days and, and that it's, it's educationally worthwhile to start before Labor Day. I mean, I could imagine that, but I could also imagine being a parent and thinking that I'd like to take off the week before Mm. Labor Day. That's when my family, that's when we always used to take our vacation. Right. And so I, I just think that it would be helpful Anyway, again, I looked at the calendar as if I were a parent and imagined the questions a parent might have, and I thought it would be beneficial for the district to explain why we think it's worthwhile to start before sure. Labor Day. And, and that we've done it before is great, but, sure. but not necessarily, because, to me, yeah. a motivating reason to yeah. do it in the future. Well, I think the, the just to speak to the, yeah. um, uh, the logic or rationale um, you had brought up and I did not, um, was consistent with what the discussion was <laughs> with the faculty. <laughs> um, obviously, everyone enjoys parents, their summer, well, but... Because uh, parents are going to see this, and they're going to have questions about it, and I think it's really sure. great for us. I believe that you all have a really good reason for doing it, and I, I want that to be communicated, So, because especially since there is such a short turnaround time. What I'm happy to do, if it helps, 
is to send the draft out to our community um, via our K-12 notification system and say, this is how the calendar is shaping up and why. And if you have any thoughts that you'd like to be considered as part of that, uh, let me know. Well, hey. um, but I think I think what we're going to hear. Listen, it's uh, it's not to say it's uh, um, a vote as much as if we're concerned right. about parents. Um, we have a way of well, notifying I, parents that it's at least out there for consideration. I will share as the parent of an elementary school children that mm -hmm. the last the week before Labor Day is actually the hardest time to find camps. So oh, for working actually. parents, it actually makes a lot of sense right. to get them back to school. No, I actually, I mean, if there's an educational rationale for setting up the calendar this way, I think putting it out in the ways that we typically do it is, is really, um, is, is really a, appropriate. It, I wasn't questioning the thing behind it. I just, I did think that, I mean, I don't know, maybe parents today are much more congenial than we were when Pete and John and Catherine were at school. But a lot of times people are frustrated by the, with the calendar once they see it, and I just, yeah. Yeah, I think just the sooner it gets out, the easier it is. Yeah. People can adjust their schedules as needed, I would assume. And educationally, I would say the sooner we get started with kids, the better. That right? makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, the conversation centered around right. around that. And I like the idea of having the PD days really not, and then not having a break before kids come right. in. You really, really built that momentum. It, it makes a lot of sense to right. me. And just uh, in terms of balance, uh, the because the question may come up. Um, if I were to look at the first five months of the school year and the second five months as the first semester and second semester, um, you know, setting it up this way does, uh, even though we have those extended weekends, um, it creates balance between the, the, the semesters are still balanced. I think there's 91 days in one semester and 92 in the other. Um, so um, I'm not, I didn't have any concerns, nor did the committee there. Just as a question, region states are set by the state. Correct. Is that correct? So you're always going to, that's that's a hard end of yes. the year, and it really questions when you start. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and there's a traditional um, schedule that usually is the state follows. Yeah. Um, but we don't always, at the time of this, have a final region schedule okay. set yet, so we're... We're speculating, but okay. um, but this one actually we we know that uh, the June exams are scheduled for that day. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So that will stay there for any uh, anybody who'd like to look at it. We will look to approve uh, next week. So if the board has any more comments, you should get them to Dr. Vellante. Okay, um, designation of the permanent chair of the election and location of May workshop meeting. So this is something that um, Ms. Familaro brought to our attention as something that we need to make sure we decide upon. So can you just talk us through? Right, well, typically in the past, um, the board president serves as the permanent chair of the election. Um, she opens and closes the polls, and, and really that's the only responsibility. Um, the reason I brought up the question about the location of the meeting for the May workshop is because in years past we've held the meeting in the band room and um, as you know the poll polling places upstairs um, if uh, Miss Daly is going to be running up back and forth to the high school at night um, after the, the polls close that's something that you know you have to decide that that is what you want her to do, um, <laughs> but the other issue um, and the other thing that I was thinking about is that the public uh, often expects to meet in the band room um, to hear the results of the vote, whether or not they uh, know that our meetings have have permanently moved to this this place. So it's I'm I'm not necessarily saying what you should do. I'm just saying that these are things that you should. Think about and um, those are really good points. Thanks for bringing yeah. them up. Well, it also requires that the election committee workers that are responsible for announcing the results have to up are there. also having to go up and down. Um, right, they'll have to come up here mm -hmm. to give you the results at the mm -hmm. when they finish. Uh, uh, Do we have plans for that night yet? <laughs> Exciting plans. I mean, no, you know, normally we try to tie an event. Before you know a I don't concert, know if it just did we do that? Automatic. Sometimes it just happens. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure if we have. Anything do we have going anything special planned? I'm hoping we have a district clerk. <laughs> 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 
Um, okay. I vote for down in the, the yeah. music room. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. I think that's sure. a smart call. Mm -hmm. It is the one meeting where a lot of times, yeah. People, people actually come. come. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to be close to the, yep. the voting yeah, location. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I um, think there is something at the school that also makes it easy for us to attend. To attend. If, it, if it turns out there is something there. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to be the um, opening and closing <laughs> person. Okay. Thank you. Do we need to vote on that or anything, or just no, tell you? No, you don't need You're to good? vote on okay. it. Um, you've, you've, I did We've just, stated it. Yeah. Okay. And I'll send out the notice about it and everything, so it'll be done. It will be done. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there any communication from the public? Okay. Board reflections. I have a reflection. Um, so I went to the Capitol Conference since I've seen you all last in Albany and advocated on our behalf and brought home uh, folders for each of you. <laughs> brought you home some materials. They were like, just point them to your, point your board to the website. I'm like, no, you've got a bunch of extra folders. Let me just take one or five. Thank you. So um, we met with um, our local officials, Sue Serino, Sandy Galliff, Peter Harkman. Um, not that he's directly our official, but a, a, a close by official and uh, spoke about NISBA's um, priorities and in this folder, all of the priorities. And it's a real education. It's, I really enjoy going because it's a real education for me on uh, the budget issues. It really breaks apart Governor Cuomo's uh, budget proposals and you know the items that, that Anna was talking about at our last meeting or a couple meetings ago about the consolidated aids and, and how that's really can uh, mess us up and how it's a real thing to be concerned about. We talked about that in detail. Um, so it's a real education for me and in here is all the information if you guys are interested. If you have any questions about anything that's in there, you want more detail, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. And I think just to tie in, when the um, NISBA conference happened last October, I made an effort to really talk about like the, the resolutions meeting and how the legislative yes. um, uh, priorities for NISBA are set at that point. And then this is sort of that's, this is then the translation of them. We, ha we haven't been a board that's, um, well, the president's gone to the Capitol Conference yeah. for years, I yeah. think. Um, but sort of then tying all those together, I thought I'd just point that out. Yeah, that's great because that's how, what Nisbet makes their legislative priorities based on what happens at based the, on what happens mm -hmm. in the in the fall, um, and so our that. input is valued. Yeah, it's yeah. Important. No, I mean the board, the boards, the state boards drive what Nisbet is then doing at this capital conference. So. Um, and the other thing I would like to share is that I spoke with our uh, PTA's president, and she uh, invited any of us to attend their. Uh, meetings that are coming up through the rest of the year. Um, we've gone back and forth with this as a board. Uh, sometimes the board has had a, an assigned liaison to the PTA, and then sometimes we haven't, and sometimes depending on the PTA's president, they've been really interested in having board reports, and sometimes they haven't. So it's kind of been an influx mm -hmm. relationship. Um, but she has invited any of us to attend the, the last few meetings, and um, it is a great opportunity to, you know, talk about our trustee um, election, to talk about the budget, things like that. So I have, like, the final meetings here. I'll just shoot you guys an email, and if anyone can attend. I mean, obviously anyone can attend anyways, but I'm, this is just my nudge via the PTA's president's nudge to attend. I will say that I attended the last... This is my way of saying I won't go to the next one, but I, I did. I attended the last PTA meeting, and um, both the presentations um, I found to be great. One was from the volunteer fire department down in Cold Spring, and they were obviously looking for people to come and join. But they had some interesting ideas about how we might recruit some of our younger students, and if, is there some way that we can create a, a credit solution for them and get them while they're young, because they feel like the time commitment is such that it might mm -hmm. be something that mm -hmm. they look forward to. And we also had a, another a presentation from the, uh, the Traffic Safety Commission from, mm -hmm. the, uh, from Putnam County, and they talked again about bus safety, and uh, I felt like it was one of those things that we had already been through, but that it was uh, 
great to hear again. So. Mm -hmm. okay. And we did a wonderful presentation about the Coherence Planning Committee. Mm -hmm. I, asked, I asked some very hard questions, I think. Uh, good. Good. <laughs> good. Okay, uh, any other board reflections? Any uh, superintendent final thoughts, please? Uh, just a few. I'll hold my comments okay. about Ms. Uh, Famalara till next meeting. We have one more meeting with Julia, so uh, <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Um, and a reminder to the board that the, as far as the budget development process, which we've been uh, very busy behind the scenes um, as an administration putting together um, a budget recommendation uh, for the board's consideration for next week. So that'll be at next week's meeting. Um, uh, so you can look forward to that. Uh, just two other comments um, related to the reports from this evening. I just wanted to highlight, Julia had mentioned uh, about the space uh, needs. Um, one, a reminder that um, the facilities uh, study and enrollment study were happening together. Um, so some point between now and the end of the year, we'll be able to have uh, some time to go into that in a little bit more depth um, as uh, that study is completed. Uh, by Western Suffolk BOCES. Um, I know we're still continuing to review um, not so much the demographic part um, or enrollment part of that, but now the, the space utilization part of that uh, one last time before they finalize the report because obviously we want to make sure that's um, accurate <laughs> before anything's presented to the board. But Julia had mentioned the flexibility of staff um, and how, um, you know, how readily our staff adapts to that environment here, which is very true. Um, our staff is incredibly professional about uh, something uh, about that, but it's really uh, that tone, um, I think, is set by the leadership of the building as well. Um, so I just uh, feel that Julia um, uh, des deserves a lot of credit for that uh, as well, for setting that tone, um, as well as um, our other administrators in their respective buildings. Um, Marianne had also mentioned the literacy learning walks, which I know I've alluded to in uh, board reports before. Uh, if we think of learning as a, as a social, as inherently a social process, um, it's important for our teachers and, and leaders to engage with professionals from other schools to share their knowledge, uh, to share their expertise, but also to enhance, as a way of enhancing their own skills and practices. And I say those, uh, those visits, um, at glance, may seem very nice, but they are very important uh, for us uh, to um, expand our capacity as professionals to hear what's working in other school systems that have some similarities to us and has some very different uh, that are very different from us in, in many ways. And I'm really glad uh, that um, we're participating in, in such things in our region, and, and we will continue to. Um, uh, and that concludes my remarks. Um, then I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. May I have a second, please? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.